Uh, welcome, colleagues, to the 28th meeting of the Devolution Further Powers Committee. Can I remind you to switch off your mobile phones or put them in at least a mode that won't interfere with us? Uh, agenda item one today, uh, I'm asking the committee to agree to take agenda item three, consideration of correspondence in private. Do we agree? Yes. Thank you very much. Agenda item two um, on the agenda relates to the correspondence that we received from HM Treasury concerning the devolution of the Crown Estate. Um, obviously, we'll need to consider the draft scheme and the draft memorandum of understanding. Uh, they are very detailed technical documents. I think they would benefit from more scrutiny. Uh, I'm certainly going to suggest to the committee today that we follow two courses of action in regard to that documentation. First, let me ask Judith Morrison from Solicitor's Office and Spice in due course for analysis of both the documents and observations on them because they are of such technical nature. And secondly, that we also pass the documentation to the Rural Affairs Climate Change Environment Committee um, as they are undertaking in-depth scrutiny of the Crown Estate provisions in order that they can come back to us and give us their view because it's, it's for us to respond to this particular document. First of all, before we move on, can we just agree with that general approach? Should the committee generally agree with that? Uh, well, I would then ask colleagues to consider what issues they might like uh, Judith from Solicitors or Graham from Spice to consider when they come back to us uh, with a bit more considered uh, viewpoint on the, the, the memorandum. I've, I've certainly got one issue which I would like to put on the record as something I think we need to look at. Um, I, I, I've got the, the understandable thrust in, in the memorandum from the UK government's perspective is to make sure that in terms of defence of the realm that nothing can get in the way of that. I get that entirely. Um, and particularly in paragraphs six and nine, where it, it lays out quite clearly what the responsibilities of the Scottish government and UK government would be. And to make sure that that clarity is underpinned as strongly as it can be, I certainly think that we need to work out, and I'd like solicitors in particular to have a look at this, um, what would have the most significant primacy in any such agreement, particularly when European regulations or directives were at play in that way? And, and would they, in terms of the memorandum, would they stand above the memorandum? And whatever, regardless what the memorandum said, we'd have to take cognizance of that and other areas of law that might interplay in that some way, so that we as a committee are certainly very clear about what that memorandum means and when it, when it finally um, is signed by the, the two um, governments. I think it is critical for that clarity. So that's my, my own particular point. Rob Gibson. Yeah. On a supplementary and a practical point, there's a special protection area off Cape Wrath on land and in the sea in the middle of what is a major bombing range. Um, that is a European inspired designation. And uh, it is the case that there could be others around where there could be a conflict between the interests of the use of the area for 110 days a year by the MOD, if they choose to, and uh, the bird breeding season, the bird feeding season, etc. So the point you raise uh, is made very clear to me uh, for members' benefit. That's just an example. Okay. I wasn't aware of that example, but that's helpful. Davish? Thank you. Uh, first of all, the convener, given we debated IGR in Parliament on Tuesday, uh, it, it probably is worth recognising that at least we're seeing a draft, and that is an encouraging um, step in a direction we've all been making some um, noise about uh, to a lesser or greater extent. Um, just two paragraphs I wanted to highlight. Um, the first is paragraph 20, where it says both government. This is in the uh, this is in the uh, draft. Uh, draft MOU, both governments commit to make the most efficient use of possible of the seabed in Scotland. Um, I would be quite interested in what the definition of efficient was there, um, so I'd uh, be grateful if uh, that could be looked at. That's probably a policy question rather than a legal question. Um, and the second one is on paragraph 16 at the top of that page where it says, should there be any further devolution of the Scottish functions within Scotland? That, for me, is pretty weaselly language. Um, the Smith Commission is abundantly clear, paragraph 33, something I know rather well. Um, this is going to happen to Scotland. To, to the islands in Scotland and I think the UK we should be asking on a policy question or I'd, I'd like to suggest on a policy question that um, that instead of should we've been quite interested as a committee in words like may and can and will well this is the one I'm going to get worked up about so I think instead of should that should be when um, and uh, I'd like to leave it with our, again our policy and um, legal advisers as to 
to politely ask both governments why they're not committing themselves to paragraph 33 of what the Smith Commission actually agreed. OK, Tavish. Um, OK, on that point. Um, I think it's up to the Scottish Government and Parliament to decide how it's going to do the management. And the question of the should and their part is only that they've said it's up to us to decide how we do this. And oh, it's not something which uh, this Parliament is opposed to, as Tavis Scott has just said, convener, because the island's policy will lead to that devolution in various ways. So I don't think that this memorandum of understanding actually impinges on the commitment of this Parliament to do just that. Well, we could get into a policy discussion today. I'm trying to make sure we're dealing with the technical aspects to make sure we've got this legally clear. Mark, I think you had one issue you wanted to raise. Yeah, um, no, it's just I, I, I know on a number of occasions within the memorandum of understanding, it makes reference to um, UK-wide critical national infrastructure, but there doesn't seem to be a definition of what is captured by the term critical national infrastructure. I, suspe I rather suspect it's self-explanatory, but I think it would be quite helpful if that could be outlined at the outset, uh, possibly in one of the annexes. And having said, Alison, well, let me just deal with this point. And having said that we shouldn't get into a policy discussion, it does say in paragraph 12, the Scottish Government will undertake the Scottish functions and manage the Scottish assets in such a way as not to the detriment of the UK-wide critical national infrastructure. But there's no pro rata there in terms of Scottish national critical infrastructure. And I'll just use an example, and I know it, didn't, it wasn't true, but actually, for instance, if, if one side of the fourth had had the Crown Estate land in it, and we couldn't have built the fourth crossing, for instance, would that be an issue that we need to concern ourselves about? As, a, as an example of potential. I could just, if I could just add to that, I think, I think the reason why it's important is that if you have those provisions, um, you can then end up in a, in, in a bind, in, in a back and forth as to whether or not you accept that something is critical national infrastructure or not. And I, I suspect that wouldn't happen, but I think there are ways to probably remove the potential for it. Fair point. Alison? Um, on that further devolution of the Scottish functions, we don't have, um, we've not been given competence to legislate over any revenues. So if, for example, someone was to invest in, in a new harbour that was on Crown Estate land and those investors were expecting a return, um, that return, as I understand, will go into the Scottish Consolidated Fund. Oh, my apologies. Um, and I'm just wondering if we could have some clarity over that, because would that not stymie investment in such an opportunity? You know, the fact that we haven't got competence to legislate over where the revenues are going. OK. Any other questions? Stuart? Well, I think the point you made about paragraph 12 was equ equally applicable to paragraph 13. Um, so a, a general point. I think my general point is that effectively... You know, I think the questions here that we want, I certainly would like answers to a clarity to, is where there's overlapped or where are the two, uh, two Crown Estates or the two governments meet. It's all, it's all the points at which they bump into each other uh, and overlap. That's where, the, that's where any of these difficulties will occur, whether it be on some of the issues with MOD or whether it be issues with other issues. I think, you know, it's, I know it's a very sort of general point to make to the solicitor on space, but effectively it's any of the points where there is this connection or overlap or the responsibilities or the effect on each other. Um, you know, that's where the issues will be. Um, I think the MOU is, generally speaking, reasonably clear, but I think it's what lies behind some of the words and some of the paragraphs uh, that it contains. Yeah, two people, one from the UK government and one from the Scottish government of the future, want to park at 39 or 41 George Street. <laughs> is there a conflict? <laughs> which is two of the properties which will be um, transferred to the Scottish government. See that in jest, but I take your point, Stuart. Any other issues? Linda? Just supplementary to that point. Remember, you know, the discussion we had about what we called at the time Crown Estate Mark II, the ability of um, the Crown Estate, uh, not under the jurisdiction of Scotland, to, to carry on doing other commercial things. Um, that could create a conflict um, quite clearly with Scottish infrastructure, back to the original point you made about that. So there should be something in it that reflects that. Again, it may be part of an annex. I think that's a very yeah, strong point. I'd actually clean forgot about that, but we, yeah, we made quite a lot of that in the earlier yeah. sessions of the committee, and we should, surely this memorandum, as Linda rightly says, should have some passing reference to what may yeah. be, become a new Crown Estate or Crown Estate 2 yeah. in the future. Yeah, good point. Malcolm? Um, hmm? 
Andy Whiteman, in his response to the draft, makes political points, which I won't read out, but he also says the draft order is riddled with inaccuracies and errors. I don't know whether his submission needs to be looked at, or perhaps the lawyers will pick those up anyway, but I don't know what that's referring to. Well, well there's certainly one issue in the order which struck me as strange, and while it, it, it lays out in Schedule 1 all of the Scottish assets that, um, that they, they tell us that they, they currently own. It doesn't seem to have any catch-all phrasing about, you know, something that says, I don't know how you phrase this in a technical legal manner, um, all assets of the Crown Estates in Scotland in a general sense. It, it does, so that in case anything's escaped. Um, and I think they're certainly strained to me in the order to be a weakness, and maybe that's what Mr Whiteman was beginning to Judith, refer to. Judith. I just pick up on a couple of those inconsistencies, which, which may well be picked up, but on the um, at number four, Scottish assets, it says Schedule 1 Scottish assets specifies the, this is on page two, specifies the property, rights and interests, and then on Schedule 1, the Scottish assets, it says, in the schedule with the exception of paragraph 17, any reference to property, rights and land. I'm just wondering about that inconsistency there, why it wouldn't say interests, because, uh, you know, property is part of that. What does that mean? Yeah. And, and also, you know, the counties, um, I think they might be worth a second look. And there seems to be a bit, a bit of inconsistency there too. And I'm not sure that there is a county of Dumfries and Galloway. <laughs> You know, for example, and and why is Stirling not called the County of Stirling? I know those are probably minor points that will be picked up in due course. Okay. Well, I see Judith is scribbling furiously, taking notes of all these particular points. Um, any particular thing you'd like to reflect on? At this? Sorry, is there any other questions before I ask Judith if she's got an immediate reflection? I'm not expecting you to answer all this stuff, Judith, obviously, but is there anything particular you'd like to? note of what we've just said? You no, know, I think that, I think that the, the committee's questions are quite clear and they'll take these away and come back to you. Okay. Okay, if we're content with that, we'll, in that case, uh, can, then we'll need to move into private and I say to the one member of the public who's come to <laughs> our proceedings, I'm sorry to make us go into... <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. see you. <laughs> And can we close the and go into private now? Thanks. <laughs>